Some breaking news right now. Disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein has taken his own life while he was behind bars. The controversies and conspiracies behind the death of Jeffrey Epstein is clear. I think once he was arrested, then the opportunity came up to sort of get rid of him. And you will not be surprised. The man rubbed shoulders with some of the biggest names in the world, names who had a reputation to protect. Several prominent figures are referenced in the documents, including former presidents like Bill Clinton. Conspirators are pointing in the direction of prominent figures who could be responsible for his death. However, however, to have a better understanding of the circumstances leading towards his death, here are the final 24 hours of Jeffrey Epstein. The details of his last days. Epstein's confinement at the MCC was far from ordinary. Given his high-profile status and the serious nature of the charges against him, special measures were put in place to ensure his safety. But even within the confines of the prison walls, Epstein's life was marked by isolation and despair. Housed in a small, bare cell, Epstein spent his days in solitude. The conditions of his confinement were stark, a far cry from the opulent lifestyle he once enjoyed. Stripped of his wealth and influence, he was left to grapple with the reality of his actions. Former employees and legal experts shed light on Epstein's state of mind during this time. They describe a man who was increasingly despondent, aware of the gravity of the charges against him and the potential consequences he faced. Epstein's isolation weighed heavily on him as he contemplated the possibility of spending the rest of his life behind bars. Despite the isolation, Epstein did have limited interactions with other inmates. Reports suggest that he kept to himself, rarely engaging in conversations or forming any meaningful connections. The nature of his crimes made him a pariah even among fellow prisoners, who viewed him with disdain. Prison staff played a crucial role in monitoring Epstein's well-being and ensuring his safety. Regular checks were conducted to ensure he was accounted for and measures were in place to prevent any harm that might come his way. However, the circumstances surrounding his death would raise questions about the effectiveness of these measures. Records obtained provide a glimpse into his psychological state and the challenges he faced while adapting to his new reality. Two weeks before his tragic demise, Epstein sat huddled in the corner of his cell, desperately trying to drown out the incessant sound of a malfunctioning toilet. The noise echoed through the narrow space, amplifying his agitation and making sleep an elusive luxury. Jail officials, keenly observing, his behavior noted his restlessness and inability to find solace in the harsh environment. The transition from a life of luxury to the stark reality of incarceration proved to be a formidable challenge for Epstein. He expressed his struggles to jail officials, referring to himself as a coward and lamenting his difficulty difficulty in adapting to the harsh conditions. Gone were the days of lavish parties and opulent mansions. Now, Epstein's existence was reduced to the confines of a jail cell. Epstein's psychological state was of great concern to the authorities, especially in light of a recent suicide attempt. Just over three weeks before his death, he had made a desperate bid to end his own life, prompting his placement under psychological observation. However, even after a 31-hour stint on suicide watch, Epstein vehemently denied any suicidal intentions. In a conversation with a jail psychologist, he adamantly asserted that he had a wonderful life and believed it would be crazy to contemplate ending it. These assertions painted a picture of a man grappling with conflicting emotions and struggling to reconcile his past with his present reality. The documents obtained from the Federal Bureau of Prisons under the Freedom of Information Act dispel the many conspiracy theories surrounding Epstein's suicide. They reveal a system plagued by fundamental failings, including severe staffing shortages and employees cutting corners. These deficiencies contributed to the circumstances that allowed Epstein to take his own life. The records underscore the need for a thorough examination of the Bureau of Prisons practices and the urgent need for reform. The first suicide attempt on July 18, 2019, Epstein's request for bail was denied. He had offered a staggering $600,000 in exchange for the ability to wear an ankle tracker while confined to his luxurious New York City townhouse. However, the court deemed him a flight risk due to his extensive international travel history, having taken 20 international flights in the previous 18 months alone. Epstein, unwilling to accept his fate, appealed the bail denial decision to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. At the time of his death, this appeal was still pending, leaving him in a state of uncertainty and desperation. It was in this atmosphere of tension and uncertainty that the initial incident unfolded. In the early hours of July 23, 2019, at 1.27 a.m., Epstein was discovered, semi-conscious in his cell with visible injuries to his neck. Prison officials immediately sprang into action, questioning his cellmate, Nicholas Tartaglione, a suspect in multiple murder and drug conspiracy cases. Tartaglione vehemently denied any involvement in harming Epstein,
Epstein, and an internal prison investigation later cleared him of any connection to the incident. However, rumors and speculation began to swirl around the circumstances of Epstein's injuries. Some claimed that he had staged the incident himself, hoping to be transferred to a different facility or to gain sympathy from the court. Others, including Spencer Kuvin, a lawyer representing three of Epstein's alleged victims, believed that it was an attack on his life, with a high probability of him being murdered in prison. In response to the incident, prison authorities took immediate action. Epstein was placed on suicide watch, a precautionary measure to ensure his safety. He was moved to an observation cell, surrounded by windows, where lights were kept on at all times. Any objects or devices that could potentially be used for self-harm were removed from his vicinity. For the next six days, Epstein remained under close observation by psychological staff. They conducted a thorough psychiatric examination to assess his mental state and determine the appropriate course of action. After careful evaluation, it was decided that he no longer posed an immediate risk to himself, and he was subsequently removed from suicide watch. Epstein was then transferred back to the Special Housing Unit, SHU, where he was assigned a cellmate and subjected to regular checks every 30 minutes. The hope was that the presence of a cellmate and increased monitoring would provide an added layer of protection and prevent any further attempts at self-harm. However, the sense of unease surrounding his well-being persisted. It was during this time that a note written by Epstein was discovered in his cell after his death. The contents of this note shed light on the disturbing conditions he claimed to have endured. In the note, Epstein detailed his grievances, including complaints about large bugs crawling on his body, allegations of guard misconduct, and instances of mistreatment. He specifically mentioned a guard named Tova Noel, accusing her of giving him burnt food and intentionally locking him in a shower cell without clothes for an extended period of time. These shocking revelations added fuel to the already raging fire of speculation and conspiracy surrounding Epstein's case. On August 8, 2019, just weeks after his first suicide attempt, Epstein signed his last will and testament. The document was witnessed by two attorneys who were familiar with him. In a surprising move, Epstein immediately gifted all his assets, as well as any remaining assets in his estate, to a trust. The will also named two longtime employees as executors, further adding to the intrigue surrounding his financial affairs. The aftermath of Epstein's first suicide attempt also had far-reaching implications for the ongoing legal proceedings. The case had already garnered significant attention and scrutiny, with numerous high-profile individuals being implicated in his alleged crimes. The revelation of his suicide attempt only intensified public interest and raised concerns about the potential for justice to be served. Psychological State the world was left in shock when news broke of Jeffrey Epstein's first suicide attempt while in custody. It was a pivotal moment that raised questions about his mental state and the factors that contributed to his alleged crimes. In the aftermath of this incident, a comprehensive psychological evaluation was conducted to gain insight into Epstein's mind and determine his level of risk. The evaluation began with an assessment of Epstein's mental health history. It was revealed that he had no prior documented psychiatric disorders or significant psychological issues issues. This finding, coupled with his outwardly confident demeanor, presented a perplexing contradiction. Epstein had consistently portrayed himself as a man in control, someone who was seemingly unaffected by the mounting legal troubles and public scrutiny. During the evaluation, Epstein maintained that he was doing fine and insisted that his life was not in danger. He adamantly denied any thoughts of self-harm or suicide, painting a picture of resilience and stability. This assertion puzzled the evaluators as it seemed incongruent with the severity of the charges against him and the potential consequences he faced. As the evaluation progressed, it became evident that Epstein possessed a remarkable ability to compartmentalize his emotions. He displayed a remarkable level of detachment from the gravity of his situation, often deflecting questions and redirecting the conversation to more mundane topics. This behavior raised concerns about his capacity for empathy and remorse, suggesting a potential lack of insight into the harm he had caused. One of the most startling revelations from the evaluation was Epstein's manipulation tactics. He exhibited a remarkable talent for charming and manipulating those around him, using his wealth, connections, and charisma to exert control over others. This skill had undoubtedly played a significant role in his ability to evade justice for so long, as well as in his alleged exploitation of vulnerable young girls. The evaluators also noted Epstein's grandiose sense of self-importance. He consistently portrayed himself as an exceptional individual, someone who was above the rules and regulations that governed ordinary 
people. This inflated self-image, coupled with his immense wealth and powerful connections, created a dangerous cocktail of entitlement and impunity. Despite these concerning findings, the evaluation did not uncover any diagnosable mental disorders or clear indications of psychopathy. Epstein appeared to possess a high level of cognitive functioning and maintained a coherent thought process throughout the evaluation. This raised questions about the true nature of his actions, and whether they were driven by a pathological need for power and control or simply a result of his distorted worldview. The evaluation concluded with a recommendation for close monitoring and enhanced safety measures to prevent any further self-harm attempts. It was clear that Epstein's psychological state was complex and multifaceted, requiring ongoing assessment and intervention. The evaluators emphasized the importance of addressing the underlying factors that contributed to his alleged crimes, including his distorted beliefs about consent and the exploitation of vulnerable individuals. From his very first day in jail, it becomes clear that Epstein's mental state was deteriorating rapidly. Epstein's complaints about jail life were incessant, ranging from poor sleep and constipation to the color of his uniform and mistreatment by fellow detainees. But it wasn't just minor inconveniences that plagued him. The noise from a broken toilet in his cell tormented him to the point where he would sit in the corner, hands over his ears, desperately seeking solace from the cacophony. Despite his litany of grievances, Epstein vehemently denied any intention of taking his own life, even when he was discovered on the floor of his cell with a strip of bedsheet around his neck, prompting a 31-hour suicide watch. He insisted that suicide was against his Jewish religion and that he was simply not capable of inflicting pain upon himself. In fact, he described his life as wonderful and declared it would be crazy to end it. But the records reveal a shocking twist in Epstein's story. Among the new revelations is an attempt by Epstein to reach out to another notorious pedophile, Larry Nassar, the disgraced USA gymnastics team doctor convicted of sexually abusing numerous young athletes. A letter sent by Epstein to Nassar was found returned to sender in the jail's mailroom, raising questions about the nature of their connection and the contents of the letter itself. Records offer a glimpse into the psychological evaluations conducted during his time in jail. These evaluations provide valuable insights into Epstein's mental state and shed light on the factors that may have contributed to his ultimate demise. According to one evaluation, Epstein was described as anxious and despondent throughout his incarceration. His complaints about jail life were not merely superficial, they were indicative of a deeply troubled mind. The evaluations expressed concern about his mental well-being, prompting jail guards and psychological experts to closely monitor his condition. Epstein's litany of complaints extended beyond the physical discomforts of jail life. He expressed dissatisfaction with his treatment by other detainees, the color of his uniform, and even the quality of his sleep. These grievances, coupled with the incessant noise from the broken toilet in his cell, created a hostile environment that further exacerbated his mental distress. Epstein's insistence on having a wonderful life and his disbelief in the possibility of taking his own life seemed contradictory to the mounting evidence of his deteriorating mental state. It raises questions about the extent to which he was truly aware of his own inner turmoil, or if he was simply putting up a facade to conceal his true intentions. Taken off suicide watch. On July 29, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was removed from Suicide Watch, a decision that would prove to be highly controversial and raise eyebrows around the world. The official explanation given by the prison authorities was that Epstein's mental state had improved and he was no longer considered an immediate risk to himself. However, this decision was met with widespread skepticism and criticism. Many questioned how Epstein's mental health could have improved so rapidly, especially considering the severity of the charges against him and the potential consequences he faced. The timing of his removal from Suicide Watch raised suspicions, leading some to speculate that powerful forces were at play behind the scenes. The responsibility for the decision to remove Epstein from Suicide Watch fell on the shoulders of the prison's chief psychologist. As the head of the mental health department at the MCC, it was her duty to evaluate Epstein's condition and make recommendations regarding his level of supervision. Critics argued that the doctor's decision to remove Epstein from Suicide Watch was a grave error in judgment. They pointed out that Epstein's wealth and connections may have influenced her decision, allowing him to receive preferential treatment. The public demanded answers, and the pressure mounted on the doctor to explain their reasoning. In the aftermath of Epstein's removal from Suicide Watch, the level of scrutiny surrounding the case intensified. The media, the public, and even Epstein's alleged victims were left wondering how such a high-profile inmate with a history of attempting suicide could be deemed no longer at risk. The controversy surrounding Epstein's removal from Suicide Watch only deepened when, less than a month later, 
later, he was found dead in his cell. The circumstances of his death raised even more questions about the adequacy of the prison's security measures and the potential foul play involved. Speculation ran rampant, with many refusing to accept the official narrative. From the medical examiner to former U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr, authorities insisted that Epstein had taken his own life. However, rumors of a sinister plot began to circulate almost immediately. One of Epstein's lawyers, Reed Weingarten, raised eyebrows when he revealed that he had met with Epstein shortly before his death. Weingarten claimed that Epstein did not exhibit any signs of despair or suicidal tendencies during their meeting. Instead, he argued that the broken bones found in Epstein's neck, which can also occur during strangulation, pointed to a more sinister explanation, one that involved foul play. Even then, President Donald Trump couldn't resist adding fuel to the fire. He retweeted a conspiracy theory that linked Epstein's death to his political rival, Bill Clinton. The connection between Epstein and Clinton was undeniable, as both had flown on Epstein's private jet, infamously dubbed the Lolita Express. But it wasn't just Clinton who had ties to Epstein. Numerous other figures from the worlds of politics and entertainment had also been associated with the disgraced financier, including Mr. Trump himself. The story of Epstein's death intersected with the themes of the increasingly influential QAnon conspiracy movement, which believed in a cabal of pedophilic elites conspiring to harm children. The circumstances surrounding Epstein's demise became a focal point for those who believed in a grand conspiracy. However, former U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr sought to dispel these theories. He personally reviewed the security footage of Epstein's cell and stated that no one else was present during the time of his death. Barr acknowledged the perfect storm of screw-ups that led to the skepticism, but maintained that Epstein had indeed taken his own life. The investigation into Epstein's death, conducted by the Bureau of Prisons and the Department of Justice, revealed a shocking series of failures. The report, released in June 2023, highlighted multiple violations of prison policies and procedures. Staff members had neglected to check on Epstein for nearly eight hours, despite him being on suicide watch. They had also failed to assign him a cellmate and left him with access to additional bed linen, which he ultimately used to end his life. The report concluded that a combination of negligence, misconduct, and outright job performance failures had created an environment where Epstein was provided with the opportunity to take his own life. The damning list of failures painted a picture of a system that had failed to protect one of its most notorious inmates. Despite these revelations, the investigation found no evidence to contradict the FBI's conclusion that Epstein's death was, indeed, a suicide. Staff members interviewed by the Office of the Inspector General maintained that they had no knowledge of any information suggesting foul play. Even the inmates locked in their cells during the relevant time frame provided no credible information to suggest otherwise. Autopsy findings further supported the suicide ruling, adding to the mounting evidence. However, the report also exposed the extent of the staff's violations. Not only had they failed to carry out the required checks, but they had also falsified documents to create the appearance of compliance. Two officers were initially charged with falsifying records, but the charges were later dropped. Instead, they were sentenced to community service, avoiding jail time. Who is being held responsible? In the critical hours after Epstein was found unresponsive in his cell at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City, a prosecutor involved in his criminal case expressed frustration over the lack of information provided by the Bureau of Prisons. In an email, the prosecutor criticized the agency for issuing public press releases before sharing basic information with Epstein's attorneys and family. The delay in communication was deemed frankly unbelievable and underscored the agency's disregard for the proper dissemination of crucial information. Another email revealed a disturbing suggestion made by a high-ranking Prisons Bureau official. The official baselessly insinuated that news reporters must have been paying jail employees for information about Epstein's death, casting doubt on the ethics of journalists and the agency's own workers. This unfounded accusation further eroded trust in the Bureau of Prisons and highlighted the need for transparency and accountability. The failings of the Bureau of Prisons extended beyond their inadequate communication. The documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act exposed severe staffing shortages and employees cutting corners, contributing to the circumstances that allowed Epstein to take his own life. An internal memo sent after Epstein's death attributed the problems at the jail to seriously reduced staffing levels, improper or lack of training, and a lack of follow-up and oversight. These deficiencies within the agency's operations were glaring and demanded immediate attention. Epstein's death prompted increased scrutiny of the Bureau of Prisons, ultimately leading to the closure of the Metropolitan Correctional Center in 2021. The AP's 
investigation into the agency uncovered deep-rooted problems that had previously gone unreported. With over 30,000 employees, 158,000 inmates, and an $8 billion annual budget, the Bureau of Prisons is the largest component of the U.S. Department of Justice. The revelations of systemic failures within this massive institution were alarming and called for urgent reform. The workers tasked with guarding Epstein on the night of his suicide, Tova Noel and Michael Thomas, were charged with lying on prison records to make it appear as though they had conducted their required checks before Epstein was found, lifeless. The absence of Epstein's cellmate, who did not return after a court hearing the day before, and the failure of prison officials to assign another prisoner to share a cell with him left Epstein alone and vulnerable. These lapses in protocol and oversight were significant contributing factors to the tragic outcome. Prosecutors alleged that Noel and Thomas, who were supposed to be diligently monitoring Epstein, were instead neglecting their duties. They were accused of shopping online for furniture and motorcyclists, walking around the unit's common area and sitting at their desks just 15 feet away from Epstein's cell instead of conducting the required rounds every 30 minutes. During a two-hour period, both guards appeared to have been asleep, according to their indictment. These revelations painted a picture of gross negligence and a blatant disregard for the safety and well-being of the inmates under their care. The failings of the Bureau of Prisons and the actions of the guards responsible for Epstein's well-being highlight the urgent need for a comprehensive investigation. The Justice Department's Inspector General launched an inquiry into the circumstances surrounding Epstein's death, aiming to hold those responsible accountable. The investigation is ongoing, and the public eagerly awaits the results. Epstein's death not only exposed the deficiencies within the Bureau of Prisons, but also raised broader questions about the treatment of inmates and the need for systemic reform. The conditions endured by those detained at the facility were described by Epstein's lawyer, Martin Weinberg, as medieval and unfit for any American defendant. The closure of the Metropolitan Correctional Center was a necessary step, but it was a tragic event that finally prompted action. But as the news of Epstein's death spread, so did the skepticism. Many questioned the official narrative, believing that there was more to the story than met the eye. How could a man with such high-profile connections, who was under constant surveillance, manage to end his own life in one of the most secure facilities in the country? Conspiracy theories began to emerge, suggesting that Epstein's death was not a suicide, but rather an elaborate cover-up orchestrated by those who feared the secrets he held. The perfect alignment of mistakes and oversights seemed too convenient to be mere coincidences. From the malfunctioning surveillance cameras to the sleeping guards, every detail raised eyebrows and fueled speculation. Frustration and anger grew among the victims and the public, demanding answers and accountability. How could justice be served if the man at the center of it all was no longer alive to face the consequences of his actions? The focus shifted from Epstein himself to those who may have been complicit in his crimes and his untimely death. As the investigation into Epstein's death continued, names of influential figures were whispered in hushed tones, who may have had a vested interest in silencing Epstein. The quest for truth became a battle against a system that seemed determined to protect its own. The Metropolitan Correctional Center, where Epstein was held, is known for its stringent security measures. Yet, in the case of Epstein, a series of inexplicable errors seemed to Aline perfectly, allowing him to take his own life. The first first red flag was the removal of Epstein's cellmate just days before his death, leaving him alone in his cell. This departure from standard procedure raised suspicions and fueled speculation about foul play. The next questionable decision was the failure to place Epstein on suicide watch, despite a previous incident where he had been found injured in his cell. This oversight, coupled with the lack of regular checks on his well-being, raised serious concerns about the level of care and supervision provided to such a high-profile inmate. Another critical aspect of the investigation investigation was the malfunctioning surveillance cameras. It was revealed that the cameras in the hallway outside Epstein's cell were not functioning properly on the night of his death. This conveniently created a blind spot, leaving no visual evidence of what transpired during the crucial moments leading up to his demise. Forensic experts have raised questions about the cause of Epstein's death. The official ruling of suicide by hanging has been met with skepticism, as some argue that the injury sustained could also be consistent with strangulation. This discrepancy has fueled theories that Epstein may have been murdered to prevent him from revealing damaging information about his powerful associates. Epstein's extensive network of influential figures, including politicians, businessmen, and even members of the British royal family, has only intensified the speculation surrounding his death. The possibility that these individuals may have had a vested interest in silencing Epstein has become a central focus of the investigation. Legal experts have pointed out the potential motives behind Epstein's death, with his trial Epstein had become a liability to those who may have been implicated
implicated in his crimes. His testimony could have exposed a web of corruption and abuse, threatening the reputations and freedom of those involved. The convenient timing of his death, just weeks before the trial, has raised suspicions that powerful forces orchestrated his demise to protect their own interests. The public outcry following Epstein's death has been immense. People from all walks of life demand answers and justice. The victims, who had hoped for their day in court, now face the harsh reality that their chance for closure may have been taken away. The focus has shifted from Epstein himself to those who may have been complicit in his crimes and his untimely death. That brings us to the end of this video. For more videos just like this, click on the cards on your screen.